What I wanted to talk about today was the, uh, uh, the, the NRCS National Conservation Standard is amending soil properties with gypsum products. Um, yeah, uh, one of the main uses for, um, uh, for this would be the phosphorus reduction uh, Dexter just talked about. But um, I was glad to see that we had a lot of talk uh, to this week about what the a National Conservation Practice Standard was because uh, a lot of time I have to spend a lot of time explaining exactly what it is. And, uh, uh, and I think that we've had a lot of talks about the standards. And, um, uh, and so it, it, it can already maybe have a little bit of a, um, a uh, um, idea of uh, what it means in RCS and what it means uh, as a whole. So, but just to, as a background, um, it, the, the practice standard is what NRCS uses to deliver their technologies. Um, it puts the emphasis on the important aspects of this particular technology and it is about putting the thing on the ground. So it's the details of what they want to recommend for any particular practice. And so um, recently they have come, they have developed a standard for using um, gypsum products and the definition is using gypsum or calcium sulfate dihydrate derived products to change the physical and our chemical properties of soil. So with this practice um, there are, are four main things that are covered in this practice uh, that, um, that are, are recommendations on how to use gypsum in, uh, as a soil amendment. One of them is to improve soil physical and chemical properties. The second is to reduce dissolved phosphorus and runoff, which Dexter just uh, talked about. The third is ameliorate subsoil <coughs> aluminum toxicity. And the fourth is reduction, uh, reduce potential of pathogens and to transport off from manures. So uh, there are two other main uses of uh, gypsum that are not covered in this standard. That would be the, the, um, to use gypsum in uh, to liberate um, uh, sodic soils and uh, also to provide calcium as a fertilizer. But the reason why these really aren't covered is that um, the NRCS already has other standards that specifically address this. Uh, the code 6, 9, uh, 610 uh, gypsum is the um, is recommended uh, method for uh, use in sodic soils and and any the calcium and sulfur components would be would be covered under the um, nutrient management that they have in the 590 standard. And I also have to add after this week, it also does not cover using um, gypsum in in dairy barns as a bedding material, since we had a talk about the concerns that were issued with that. Uh, uh, the um, the so. The reason I uh, was what I was going to kind of concentrate here is the two that are really relevant to this uh, particular conference was to reduce dissolved phosphorus and runoff and also to reduce the potential pathogens in the transport. Uh, uh, so for the water quality, the phosphorus concentration and runoff, um, it, uh, it, the, um, the um, subsurface uh, drainage, um, the, the criteria calls for about no less than one ton per acre, uh, it, uh, but it's, it's only to be applied when you have high rate, either you're applying manures or you have a soil test that, that's um, rated um, in the high or very high um, the phosphorus index or, or the, uh, the rate of the soil test is um, is a, uh, shows that you've got a, uh, excessive phosphorus in there. Usually that is going to also be associated with animal manure applications where you get these very high um, soil test rates and that this would be an applicable application for that. Um, and then uh, that's these, uh, both of them are one ton per acre. Uh, the soil testing uh, can be done when it's just, when you have high rates of uh, of uh, phosphorus and I believe uh, the work that Kevin King did was based on just high soil test phosphorus rates and then the, the work that Dexter just talked about was when you have uh, when you have manure application 
And the, one of the important aspects of that is that you need to apply the gypsum within five days of the manure application so that the gypsum comes into intimate contact with the manure so that it can react. Uh, we did one study where the gypsum was applied and then the litter was applied about three or four weeks later and there was very little impact to uh, um, much reduced impact of the gypsum in those, that condition. One of the advantages of the gypsum when applied to manure is it stops that initial runoff event. Um, I think, uh, uh, Philip, you showed some of the work that you've done and shown that you, what, you get 75, 80 percent of the, of the phosphorus runoff comes from the first major runoff event. And so this is a way to reduce that first initial runoff event that will, that will contribute to a lot of the annual phosphorus um, runoff. So uh, um, this is just a slide showing that the, how the uh, FTG gypsum can reduce the, uh, the phosphorus, uh, the water soluble phosphorus in soil uh, uh, with increasing rates. And uh, this is a slide showing, this is some of the same material that Dexter showed where uh, if you apply the, um, uh, when you apply manures you get a large increase in soluble phosphorus coming off the field and then you get a, a reduction in uh, as you uh, reduce the, um, the phosphorus, uh, uh, as you increase the gypsum rates, you're going to reduce the phosphorus that's in runoff. So another part of the criteria was uh, um, reducing pathogen uh, transport and this uh, recommendation is that you use two tons uh, of gypsum uh, per acre uh, in also within five days of applying the uh, manure and to, uh, to reduce the losses of, um, of uh, um, uh, microbial uh, um, components that are in the runoff. Uh, this is a picture of some of the data that was collected for this at, um, at Watkinsville, Georgia, uh, and they showed a significant reduction in the amount of, of, um, of microbes, the E. coli that was recovered in the runoff when they used gyps. A lot of this was due to, they did find a significant increase in water infiltration and they just think that that first flush of water, uh, uh, the microbes moved on into the soil and then therefore was a contributing downstream um, to, to contribute to a lot of this benefit. So, uh, okay, this is just more of the results. So, but I did want to talk about some of the um, other, as a part of the standard, it also has more details about um, things that you should be concerned about and uh, in, in some general um, things in, in, if you're going to use this practice. Um, uh, one of the things that they, you have to show is that you've got to validate the, uh, the product and uh, that, that means that you've got to document the basically the heavy metals in the material and uh, um, it showed that it's a, it's a, uh, there's a lot of products that claim to be gypsum or claim they could work as effectively as gypsum. You've got to document it that. One of the big concerns would be if you're using gypsum like the flue glass uh, FTG gypsum, it has to be the only the gypsum that's been used after the fly ash has been removed before you, the gypsum is formed, otherwise it heavy metals in it is too high, um, but flue gas uh, FTG gypsum that's produced after removal fly ash is acceptable for, for this use. And there actually is a table of what the heavy metal limits should be, uh, are for, um, for gypsum and these, uh, um, the EPA has not finished their risk assessment, but I'm almost positive their table will look something like this. Currently they say that the heavy metals and gypsum can be higher than biosolids, which is a reasonable thing. If it's safe to put it on biosolids, it should be safe for gypsum. But actually, I think it'll, the actual limits will come out lower and it'll be more like this table that is currently in there. One thing that uh, is also in there is the, the limit for uh, radon. And because there's a limit on, uh, on radon, um, that would eliminate use of gypsophosphate in most cases, unless it was 
in some cases I think it doesn't have a lot of radium in it and it could be used for this purpose, but for the most part it eliminates gypsum phosphate from this process, uh, from this standard. So, um, so a couple of other things that uh, that's important is that um, we have to uh, you have to make sure that the uh, any um, ruminants aren't uh, or livestock in general, but particularly ruminants, um, do not have access to the stack gypsum. And also um, that if you apply the gypsum, you need to wait till uh, at least one rainfall or irrigation event so that the gypsum can um, be uh, washed off or moved from the forage itself and then on into the soil. And um, this is to create, uh, to, um, it's a cautionary to keep um, from uh, ruminants are susceptible to uh, to uh, um, sulfate poisoning, and uh, uh, if they get too much sulfate in their diet, they can be uh, detrimental. So this is just an over caution for that matter. And um, there is some limits. Uh, you shouldn't apply it if the soil test calcium is above the maximum level and it should not exceed five tons per acre I think a year and um, and I think over the long term you could see some issues with uh, um, too much uh, calcium you might have problems with uh, or too high rates with um, leaching some of your calcium and, and, and other cations from soil that might cause some long-term problems if you get too high applications. So, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was just the adoption of the, um, of the three, uh, of, the, of the standard, the, uh, I think we, they talked a little bit, maybe some of this was explained, is that there is a national standard, but then each state has to adopt their own version of the standard, and, uh, and they have, within limits, can tweak that to their individual states. It's an idea that, you know, most things, one size doesn't fit all. And just like we saw the presentation on there's changes in the, in the manure planning uh, the plans, uh, there's each state will have to adopt their, uh, their, can move it around a little bit and make sure it works for them. So uh, while it is a national standard, it's only currently being adopted by, um, by the states. And so I thought I'd give a highlight of which, where we are at this point. So far, there are about 20 states have adopted this standard into their um, into a state standard. And the important component of this is it's a standard, no matter how you look at it. But the natural re um, NRCS will support with the EQIP um, funds conservation programs, but it's highly unlikely that they're going to get any funds, or almost impossible to get any funds in EQIP if your state has not adopted this as a national standard, I mean as, as a state standard. So it's those states that adopt it that potentially could also contribute through EQIP to support this practice. So it is, I thought I like to put up this map just to show where it's been adopted. It's, uh, some of it can be explained. Um, I think this area is, is driven by the, the, uh, the phosphorus uh, questions um, with the uh, um, issues with the Great Lake and the phosphorus runoff and trying to come up with some solutions on how to deal with the uh, phosphorus runoff into the Great Lakes. Um, I don't know why we have a, a large adoption here unless it's, had, it's not to do with the sodic soils because that's not part of the, of the standard. So I'm not sure why uh, that's been a, a, concentrated area and I'm less understand why there's really been uh, I think it probably even more effective some in here in the southeast where we have a lot of poultry industries not been adopted but but uh, we have it in Alabama um, Alabama's not only has gypsum in there as a national standard they also have as part of their 590 uh, in their phosphorus index as, as a method that you can help um, with your uh, reduce um, phosphorus runoff the, uh, this is the uh, payment schedule, and I, maybe some of you from the NRCS can 
can explain this a little, or correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm told that the payment schedules are done on a regional basis and not on a state by state basis. And North, uh, in that North or Midwest, I guess, is this is what they've come up with as the payment standard, what they will support, and it's basically $36 per acre for, uh, for gypsum application. The, uh, uh, so, so far, I think I got this data back in uh, December that um, what had been done up through 2016. And uh, so there's been about 280 um, contracts that have been uh, um, issued by NRCS for the practice standard. It's added up to about $818,000 that they have given out to support this practice today. So with that, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. been with poultry litter and that's because that's the 800 pound gorilla in Alabama uh, and we, uh, we practically have no dairy industry uh, in the state and our hog industry the, or the, the hog industry is much reduced um, over time but the, there's no dairy to speak of um, so I have no reason to think that it would not work just as effectively um, uh, the, some of the initial work that I did uh, it was with dairy, uh, not with the slush, but with a, the, the manure, and it worked, it worked fine with that. Um, but, uh, but all our work efforts have been done with poultry litter to date. Uh, have you looked at the phosphorus fertilizer in combination with the southwestern states that you can really explain why they uh, well, the, why they not adopt? Well, uh, well, I should explain that the, the, where we where we have seen where this practice would be put in place would be for where you're applying poultry uh, manures, and in those cases there will not be a phosphorus. Um, the, the, there, all the soil test phosphorus levels will be well above, probably four times above. Or more, what the uh, uh, where you have plant response. Um, the the issue is always with poultry litter is when you apply it as the nitrogen rate, you're you're applying almost as much phosphorus, but you need the plant only needs about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, how much extra five five times more nitrogen than the, than it needs phosphorus. So you're always applying more phosphorus than you need to when you apply it at the nitrogen rate and so over time you're going to build up the phosphorus and it well exceeds and most of these poultry people on um, poultry farms um, want to utilize this manure themselves it's, it's a good source of fertilizer and so their phosphorus levels raise are uh, really elevated sometimes 200 400 parts per million in these soils and so you, we couldn't, can't see us ever wanting to use this in conjunction with poultry litter unless your soil test phosphorus is already sky high. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does actually. Uh, one thing I was thinking was maybe, like in North Dakota, we don't use the maintenance uh, approach uh, in our phosphorus fertilizer recommendation. There are states that use the build up or the build up approach or so. Yeah. So I was thinking maybe that could have an influence as well. It, well, it, you know, the, 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 it becomes almost irrelevant which, which type of uh, what approach you have to phosphorus because we're so far above what's even reasonable uh, that uh, it, to get to this, like for the soil test, it was the higher, it's ex exceedingly high. As she, yes, she, at least in Alabama. That's four times, they set that rate at what they found as an uh, economic response or a, a get a, uh, I mean a response to phosphorus fertilizer and then multiply that by four to say this is the limit. One more question? Uh, 
on these gypsum products, is there any concern of any other contaminants um, being part of that product? The, the, the FTD gypsum is extremely um, consistent. Most of the contaminants that come into the gypsum is actually from the lime that they use. Uh, they take ground lime and they, uh, and they spray that into the, and it, to take out the sulfur. And so most of the contaminants that you have in the, uh, in the FTD gypsum comes from the, from the limestone as long as the, is the, uh, that you've already taken out the flue gas, I mean the uh, fly ash. The, uh, uh, there's a few that are of concern. Arsenic is one of them. Um, yeah, there are, I should say, they're higher than what you have in mine gypsum. Mine gypsum also has a lot of contaminants in it, and a lot of it's only sold at, I think, 80 percent um, Gypsum, uh, calcium sulfate it, um, is is a typical rate for uh, mine gypsum. So you know, 20 percent out of something else. Uh, but there's a lot of contaminants also in the mine gypsum. is just different than what you have in the flue gas. Uh, the ones that are of concern are arsenic, and selenium, and uh, and mercury. Uh, that in most of those are the ones that get through the process. Of the uh, uh, of taking out the blue gas, I mean the uh, fly ash, uh, are um, are those components that can show up in your gypsum. But they're still very very low. This table that I showed is is what the limit we believe will be um, that the EPA will finally come up with. They're currently doing a risk assessment, but that's what we think it will be. Okay, thank you. Thanks.